Hello all and welcome to this Irish Construction Group webinar. Today we'll be looking at our hand arm vibrations myths causing unnecessary human and financial costs. My name is Michael Harding, I'm one of the committee members of the Irish Construction Group uh, with my day-to-day -day job being a senior check advisor with Equans. I will be your host today with Amir in the background ensuring everything runs smoothly. If you have any questions throughout the following presentation, please may I ask that you put these in the Q&A box below. We have around about 20 minutes after the presentation where we'll answer as many questions as possible. Questions not answered in this time will be answered and published on the Irish Construction Group website. For CPD, we do not provide any certificates for this webinar. However, an email on proof of attendance will be sent after the presentation, which you can use for your records. Now, I'm delighted to introduce you all to Peter Wilson. Peter is a mechanical engineer holding a master's of science in acoustic and vibration with a vast experience over 40 years in this field, covering a very wide range of industries. He designed the award-winning eco barriers, award-winning fan noise control technology and novel structural vibration dampeners. In the field of house, he contributed to the original HSE database that fed into the current regulations and was included as an independent expert in the HSE roadshow that launched the regs. To top this all off, Peter created the competence course for haves and noise for the Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Without further ado, audience, I would like to all introduce you to Peter. Peter, over to you. Good afternoon, just. Uh, a band of dedicated professionals. Um, as Michael said, I have been doing this for a very, very long time and it is seriously depressing of the fact that so many organizations are continuously finding new and highly technical ways of messing up hand on vibration risk management. So I'm going to be very blunt today um, and very pragmatic about this um, because it's important. People are suffering serious injuries from this. So without further ado, uh, let me share my screen. Just one second. <clears throat> right. Right, I hope you can all see that. Unfortunately, hand on vibration is regarded as a very technical subject, and this opens the gates for a whole load of mythology and uh, misunderstandings. So I'm going to be running through those and also highlighting the key issues in terms of effective risk management. <clears throat> the major myths are several. First of all, vibration measurement and risk assessment mentality is really bad. It's uh, most of it is placebo monitoring and mismeasurement and marketing hype. It's much simpler than most people think, and I'm also a lot, a lot, much, much less costly. Um, training and education is also an area. There are lots of training courses and toolbox talks and so on that are, if you like, very, very worthy and very, very general and doesn't really don't really have any impact. You're trying to have behavioral change. PPE for haves still considered to be PPE, PPE, and there isn't any, it's an oxymoron. Also, there are organizations who will do tool maintenance and claim to do vibration measurements that tell you that what the risk is from the tools. And normally this is just PR. It doesn't actually give you any useful information. There's also a rumor that vibration control at source is never possible. In a lot of cases it isn't, but in some cases it is. So I'm going to be going through that as well. And finally, industry has made large, big strides in reducing the vibration from a lot of pieces of kit. That's because there is no PPE. In noise, very little progress, but in vibration, some manufacturers have done a great job. So I'll be talking about that as well. First off, a case study. A fairly recent case study, an organization with many uh, workshops across the UK. The HSC were very interested as they'd had some HAVS claims um, and improvement notices were issued. Now their previous consultants doing risk management and risk measurement for them had done quite a lot of measurements, but very little in the way of recommending activity, actions to reduce risk. Big problem. They then suggested as as a result of the um, HSE involvement, that they should measure every tool the company had every year. 
massive expense and still no action to reduce risk. So we were asked to look at this and the, this is really, if you like, a very simple outline of the program that every organization should be following. First off, a tool register and an activity register. A tool register is the, actually the number of tools, each tool that's used in the company. The activity is how the tools are used because some tools are used on multiple activities which have different risks. And we always suggest that this should be done online because then you get accessibility from anywhere. It can be a simple spreadsheet or it can be something more sophisticated. In parallel with that, we did a management briefing to bring senior staff and supervisors up to speed and to what the risks were in their organization and what needs to be done about it. And then ranking the risks by combining vibration data and trigger time data, most of it virtual with just a few site measurements on some unusual pieces of kit. So that's quick and effective. And in parallel with all this, start doing risk reduction actions. We managed to ban three high risk tools immediately. They could find alternative ways of doing it. Um, toolbox talks that were specific to their particular problems and implementing a program of trying to change behavior, uh, behavior and operational factors that in affect risk. Um, <clears throat> a buy hire smooth policy to improve the tooling as we go along and a brief touch on risk assessment, on health surveillance rather. On the basis of this, we proved that the risks were tiny compared to what was expected and what would previously been discussed. So since the risks are much, much lower, the HSC is very mollified and the pressure is off. Key thing is personal behavior. Um, this person is, is doing high risk activity. He's got these newfangled hearing protection that work extremely well, even in the vicinity of your ears. He's smoking, which increases risk because it reduces blood circulation to the extremities. He only needs to be visible from behind. He needs one glove off, so his hand is cold, which increases risk because he needs to remove his cigarette. He's using a vibratory roller, which is high risk from noise and less than 48 minutes a day before he reaches the maximum permissible exposure. So high risk activity, personal behavior, putting him at more risk. And human behavior is just one of those things. Would you have expected that? People will find ways of behaving in, in ways you just never expected. Just a quick review. The damage caused by hand vibration is blood vessels, uh, nerves, and joints. It actually damages the blood vessels. It damages the nerves. It damages, the, damages bones, muscles, and tendons. And serious swelling, serious pain, touch, sense of touch. The key to all this is it can be a very, very serious injury. I was talking to a doctor who came on one of our courses and one of his clients, one of his patients has such advanced symptoms, they couldn't even wipe their own bottom. So that's why we have the toilet paper there. And of course it's very important that toilet paper is hung the right way around. That's one of the key things. But if you imagine you can't even wipe your own bottom, it's a very serious risk and a serious injury. That's why we're so concerned. And some of the things are horrible, you know, the, the white finger, damaged fingers, um, ulcers and operations for carpal tunnel syndrome and so on. So to avoid this, to reduce the minimize the risk of this to the lowest level reasonably practical, this is the program. So the two first, the first two elements are the bit that most people focus on, identifying potential tools and operations and assessing the risks from those. So you're combining finger on trigger time, accurate finger on trigger time with vibration data. You then need to train everybody in what the expectations are, what they should be doing and how they should be behaving. You need a risk reduction program, which includes all the usual things, but ergonomics, operating conditions, maintenance, engineering modifications and so on. This is very important since equipment in the vibration field is being developed continuously improved equipment. Health surveillance program, Again, if you have an exposure likely to be above 2.5 meters per second squared, you need to have one of these. But the key thing is all that needs to be audited. It's no good having it written down on paper. You need to make sure it's working in practice on site. And so looking at risk assessment and measurement, um, you all know about this. This is the re requirements of the regulations. Maximum dose exposure limit value of five meters per second squared. 
and exposure action value, which, which you have to start doing risk control measures is um, at 2.5 meters per second squared. That sounds accurate, 2.5. So you say, okay, 2.5, 2.4 is okay, 2.6 is bad. These are finger in the air risk assessments. It's 2.5-ish, somewhere between one and a half and three. Five meters per second squared, somewhere between four and maybe seven or eight. On a cold day, four. On a hot day with good, good ergonomics, it may be the same risk as a, as a vibration value of or risk value of six to seven meters per second squared dose, daily dose. So these are not accurate, but they are approximate. And one of the big problems is the safety industry. I do not much like this industry, my industry. So a lot of it is based on risk measurement culture which assumes assessment is, a, is an end onto itself rather than providing the information you need to change things. So there's a tendency of people, we get people on the courses who pay in consultants to measure the tool vibration every year or so. It's completely unnecessary, a waste of money, and you should spend the money and resources on risk reduction rather than measurement. In addition, many of the measurements we see are inaccurate. They've been done by rote. You just plug the meter in, press a button, write down the result. There's all sorts of ways that this gives really bad results. Strapping transducers on with tape or poorly mounted at the wrong location, damaged transducers, cable faults, etc. It's time consuming to get accurate data. Also where you measure, this is a, a um, a tool with a anti-vibration handle. If you look at the vibration as the handle vibrates, high vibration at the end, low vibration near the tool, and a low vibration point very in, right in the center on the vibration isolated tool. So where you measure can have a significant effect on the vibration risk that you think you have. So the key thing is to rank the risks. So you're looking at job card activities and operations that pose a risk. And you knew, do need to create a tool register, all the tools that are used. And this is very time consuming. We had a client in South Wales and I asked them how many tools I th they thought they had. And they said about a hundred. They ended up with over 450. There's loads of tools in cupboards and small tools and tools that they aren't used very often. It's a difficult thing and it takes time. Also, we get tool registers. People, companies say we have a tool register and a very accurate, a good tool register. And on it, it just says blue drill, which isn't very helpful. You need to know what sort of drill, hammer action or not, and how it's used, because it may be used in very different ways. So that needs to be prioritized. But it is very, very important. If you're using a tool that's not on the tool register, you're doomed. As far as uh, trying to defend a claim would be concerned. So resource allocation spend the minimum assessment and the maximum on reducing risk rather than more and more measurements. So vibration data, as far as possible, acquire field data that's done in proper working conditions that, that reflect the way you use the tools on your site. So acquire field data from published sources, reliable published sources. This will give you a very good idea of the range of likely risks you have from your tools. You can supplement this with some vibration measurements, but try and keep that to a minimum because it's expensive and time consuming. Then you need to acquire trigger times, accurate. If you ask somebody how long they use an angle grinder for, they'll say two hours a day. I automatically divide by four because they may be using the tool for two hours, but the actual pressing the trigger is probably only half an hour. So that can give an unrealistic estimate of the risk by combining that with the vibration data. And what you're trying to do is rank the risks so that you can, if you like, put most, initially put most of your resources into reducing the high risk activities that can cause damage quickly. Once you have good data, there's no further need to carry out vibration measurements. You wouldn't think that that was the case if you go online and look at vibration risk assessment. For example, road reinstatement, basically digging trenches with whackers and tar on tarmac and concrete surfaces and uh, breakers and so on. If you get the data on those surfaces for a meter of trench, 
you can then calculate for any particular project. So what would be the risk for five meters of trench, 10 meters of trench, two meters of trench? You do not need to remeasure. The reason measurements are difficult is illustrated by this video. So on the riveting gun, there are two measurement locations. You have to measure at both hands. So that's two measurements already. You also need to measure on the doily on the other side of the rivet. And this is also quite a dangerous activity. So you have to be very careful. So it takes a long time. And initially the measurements we'd seen prior, prior to, to our measurements had been done. The meter was seriously overloaded. They hadn't used a mechanical filter. So the yeah, data was inaccurate. So virtual assessment, the HSE, guidance said says use reliable published field data for risk assessments wherever possible they say you spend your resources reduce risk not on more measurements carrying out a measurement is very time consuming and costly because you're trying to you need management time to get all the tools together in the same place to organize operators to organize real work and locations get time consuming measurements done we reckon it's we we our rule of thumb is 10 to 20 tools a day if everything goes well our record is zero because the compressor broke. It's important to know that once you've got good data, you don't need to up, you don't need to carry out more measurements. Just update if things change. So you only need to do this once. The key thing is: will additional measurements affect your risk reduction actions? If the answer is no, don't do them. Looking at tool use. So we have the same angle grinder used for cutting off and we have it used for fettling. Now for cutting off it's 12 meters per second squared and for fettling it's three meters per second squared. So the same tool, very different activities. So this tool on our database would have two or three entries for different uses. So we have an online database that we use for most of our risk assessments now. It's got thousands of activities on there so we can assess most risks instantly off our database. You can do the same in-house using an online uh, spreadsheet, but you do need to create a comprehensive risk register and you must not allow anyone to use a tool that is not on the risk register. You can download a template tool register from our website. Um, this gives you an idea of the amount of data required to do an accurate risk assessment. It's not just the manufacturer, it's also the, the accessories that are used and how they're used and the sort of job it's used on, because these can give very different results. It also makes a lot of sense to combine noise with hand-on vibration. So if you've got tools, that, with high vibration tools on your spreadsheet, include noise data with that. We automatically calculate with the safe working distance for noise as well, which is a very simple risk reduction thing you can do in construction or on sites we're using mobile, mobile tools. You know, where people within four meters, anyone can understand that. You can also use a mobile, um, so you can walk up to any piece of kit and work out what the risks are from noise and vibration. And another benefit is if you've got a lot of data, you can do risk statistics. So it can tell you what the spread is for a particular type of tool. So the spread in values for leaf blowers and for angle grinders here and for rivet guns, you can see for angle grinders, a huge spread. So what you're trying to do in risk reduction is to knock off the top ones, which you do by choosing lower vibration tools, by, if you like, also making the tools more, get, buying more ergonomic tools if possible, because that's also a risk factor, and by maintaining them properly. So what you're trying to do is to reduce the spread of values by knocking off the high um, vibration end. For rivet guns, it doesn't really matter what you do, it's not gonna make much difference. So you don't have to worry about maintenance because a knackered rivet gun has got the same vibration as a brand new one. <clears throat> so develop your own database. In simple cases, as I said, an online spreadsheet that combines noise and vibration. The sort of things you can do with that is you use it for your, for your tool register. You can use it for future vibration assessments. It's quicker and easier to use, use um, published data. You can also upload any additional measurements so everyone's got access to them immediately. 
and the statistics aid maintenance programs. And also for historic exposure estimation, you need past data from past tool use. <clears throat> what you're trying to do is to make this whole process as simple and easy as possible. And also you can use it for purchasing and hiring process. So you can try and choose low vibration tools that have got better ergonomics and so on. But also you must document your actions. So it's no good if an HSC inspector comes on site and you haven't got documentation of what you've done over the past five years to reduce risk. Give access to all this data to everyone anywhere. Now this is a particular bugbear because of modern new technology. So the British standard and international standard for vibration measurements we have, have is <coughs> 5349. 5349, verily it says, you must fix the accelerometer rigid to the handle. Rigidly. Hand gripped accelerometers may be used on soft handles, but with care, because they don't give accurate data. Now, all the risk statistics used to estimate the relationship between vibration dose and vibration damage, which is used to define the upper exposure limit, exposure limit value and the uh, lower 2.5 meter per second value are based on hard mounted transducers. So any measurement technique that doesn't give exactly the same answer is wrong by definition, end of. So the accelerometer needs to be fitted rigidly to the handle. So this is a model of how that works. You have the accelerometer attached rigidly to the handle. And then you have your hand, arm and wrist, which has got all these variables, you know, how stiff they are, how much damping, how tightly you grip it, all these sorts of things. If you have a wrist mounted or a glove mounted, you are moving the transducer away from the tool. So the vibration has to travel from the tool handle through the hand into the wrist and the arm. That has a massive effect on the transmission of the vibration into your monitoring transducer. So that doesn't comply with the standard and doesn't give you accurate data. But the technology is so attractive. You have handheld transducers, glove or wrist mounted transducers. These are often touted as the latest in the measurement culture. The latest measurements, you can do this, you can do that. Unfortunately, measure many of the claims about this equipment is deliberately disingenuous. And at worst, users have been misled into thinking that the vibration measurements comply with the standard. Now, we have recommended temporary use of these sorts of techniques as part of the risk management strategy in the early times to get finger on trigger time data and so on. But they cannot be used to generate risk assessment vibration data reference the standard. The literature often does not make this clear, so cave caveat emptor. Looking at the vibration dissimetry guidance in the new HS, the latest HSE guidance, here's a couple of extracts. Must I continually monitor workers exposed to vibration? No, probably not good to use your, your, your time and resources. Once you have enough information to estimate the exposure, shift your focus to investigating and taking steps to reduce the exposure. Another one, I'm using monitoring to make sure my, continuous monitoring to make sure my workers keep below the exposure limit. Isn't that sensible? Just because you think it's below the limit doesn't mean you're complying with the law because exposure has to be reduced to as low as reasonably practical. Another classic one, do hand arm vibration measurements need to be taken on the tool? Well, yes, because that's what the standard says. Any measurement taken away from the palm of the hand or where the measurement position is on the back of the hand, fingers or wrist is unlikely to provide reliable measurement. And the HSC explicitly states there is currently no wrist or glove mounted device which measures vibration suitable for use in a vibration risk assessment. Now, I think that for the HSC is incredibly blunt and incredibly, you know, is there, is there any room for wriggle, wriggle room in that statement? I don't really think so. And yet, continuous monitoring is used a lot. 
the question you should ask yourself is, will, will additional measurements or continuous monitoring affect my risk reduction actions? No, don't do it. Yes. Would the added cost provide sufficient benefits compared with the alternatives like virtual assessment and statistical analysis of your data so you know what the risk is per meter of trench or for each activity that your company, high risk activity you're carrying out? It's almost invariably better to spend the resources on risk reduction. This is an expert view from someone, uh, Chris Nelson, who's a fellow of, colleague of mine on the BSI committee, HAVS committee. Um, he was, he helped write the regulations. So take this to heart. I'm gonna read it out because it is so important. He's looking for a narrative on how an organization managed a problem. A risk assessment or audit shows the hazard was identified, but it doesn't say what was done about it. There's been a lot of discussion about how to measure vibration. If employers focus their efforts on measurement without putting risk reductions in place, all they're doing is providing evidence against their organization should a claim ever arise. There have been fines of half a million pounds for organizations that monitor everything but haven't done risk reduction. He says this is guilty knowledge and, and suggests rather than worrying about how precisely how high risk is and continuously monitoring it, just work to reduce it. Despite all this, if you go online and look up some of the suppliers' comments or what they say about their instrumentation and monitoring systems online, these are some of the things they say. Have dosimetries record the entire vibration dose imparted unlike any other system available. Personal daily vibration exposure meter complying to ISO this, measurement under gloves according to ISO that, triaxial accelerometer complying to ISO this. ISO 5349 is the way to measure vibration to assess risk. The acceler accelerometer complies, but the way it's mounted and the way it's used doesn't. So it cannot be used for risk assessment, despite the facts implying it can be. These dosimeters measure and record the vibration received by the operator. It makes the circumstances irrelevant. It's measuring the exact dosage, protecting everybody. The trouble is it's not measuring to the standard, so it's not doing any of that. This system follows the standards required by 5349. Triaxial system sensors, again, the sensors comply, but the measurement system doesn't. And there's also the implications about insurance. It's often implied that insurance companies expect you to do continuous monitoring. One of the big insurers, Q QBE, begs to differ. They actually state there is no requirement for continuing monitoring, and we do not expect this as a condition of insurance. So none of this kit, which is wrist, finger, glove, palm, complies with the standard for measuring risk for risk assessments. Period. It's very, very simple. None of them use a transducer rigidly amounted to the handle, so they don't comply. We've done back-to-back -back testings of all these systems measured in parallel on the exactly the same tool at the same time. I think it's always dependent on the weather. It's just obviously through the summertime. Yeah, it Doesn't it? Uh, it goes into your palm, yeah, isn't it? Isn't yeah. it? A little bit. Yeah. You can use one for the tissues you need, can't you, Matthew? I can take these two off. Yeah. We published on our website an article agreeing with the HSE that there are no wrist, glove, or whatever mounted accelerometers uh, systems that comply with standards. One of the manufacturers um, took us the SA, saying that we were uh, messing with their business model. And the ASA came down against them saying that statement, wrist mounted transducers do not measure hand or vibration in, in accordance with the standard. So you can't use them, for, they're not suitable for risk assessments. So the claims against INVC were not upheld. That's two months of my life I'm never gonna get back. But it just shows you the commercial pressures involved in trying to persuade people to measure continuously using all sorts of um, novel instrumentation. It's not to say there won't be improvements in the future, but you have to prove that they are effective. You have to prove that they actually comply with the standards 
that's a long process. Looking at the results of measuring them all in parallel, along the bottom, the x-axis here, we have different types of kit. So we have an impact wrench, we have a rail saw, we have a tamper, and we have a sleeper drill. So in blue, we have the ISO measurement, the correct measurement standard on the right and the left hand. So on the right hand, we have the difference between the correct measurement, the hand-mounted transducer, and the wrist-mounted transducer for each of these tools. And there are significant differences. So the wrist-mounted transducers tend to overestimate for these tools, as do the palm, the hand-mounted transducers compared to the real measurements. The high-risk tools, they underestimate. But one of the key things here is the fact that none of them measure on the other wrist, on the other hand. So what happens if it's not your right hand, it's the highest level? In a court, a court of law, you can't defend this because it, you can just say it's the other hand that was a higher vibration value and you haven't measured that unless you wear two of them. And that never happens. In addition, on this particular case, you can see the effect of loosening the wristband. It increases the measured vibration substantially. So if we look at the um, percentage, the, the y-axis is percentage uh, compared with the standard, underestimating on the high, highest um, risk tool, overestimating on the others, and a big increase due to um, having a loose wristband. The other thing that's come to light fairly recently is the fact that there's a lot of reported problems with, with uh, carpal tunnel syndrome from people having watches too tightly strapped to their wrists. And that includes wrist-mounted watches that are measuring vibration. The next topic is training. It's very important because you're trying to change behavior because personal behavior has a massive impact on the health risk posed by any, any given vibration exposure. So you can have two operators exposed to the same vibration. One of them is at much higher risk than the other due to their behavior. So there are various levels of tra training. So management, managers and supervisors, personal motivation about company policy and what needs to be done to minimize risk. Toolbox talks for operators and supervisors. This is a big thing because there's a lots of toolbox talks around, but they're all very worthy and generic and you know, people just sit there and watch them and don't really take them in. You have to make them attention grabbing, bespoke. So, oh, he's using a tool that I don't use, so I'm not really that interested. It's much more impactful if you actually tell them about things like not being able to wipe your bottom if you allow this to go on, telling them about actual case studies and using tools and circumstances that they are familiar with. For competency training for large companies or for people who are consultants and so on, we do a lot of that and the INVC IOSH competency training course is one of those. And now we have the risk reduction program. So the key factors in getting the risk factors are vibration dose, which is a combination of vibration amplitude plus finger and trigger time. But also tool design, ergonomics and weight is very, are very important, which includes tool use, you know, um, Awkward positions mean the ergonomics are worse, so it means the risk is higher. Working conditions is a big one. Temperature, circulation to the extremities is very important. Cold, cold hands are much, much higher risk. So keeping working conditions higher temperatures possible and frequency of breaks to exercise your hands between uh, high-risk activities so you're getting more blood circulation. Plus there's a load of individual susceptibility and habits, genetic factors, general health, smoking, use of things like beta blockers and so on. So suspect any process that causes tingling or numbness after five to 10 minutes of continuous use. PPE. So this poor bloke has been asked to go forth and descale that valve. So he's gone forth, he's wearing all this PPE He's wearing a hard hat, he's wearing goggles, he's wearing a mask, and he has got gloves on, conventional gloves. But for hand-arm vibration, it's very, very simple because there isn't any. Anti-vibration gloves, that's just what they're called, it's not what they do. The same with the anti-vibration foam tape you can wrap around handles. Gloves are useful to keep hands warm and provide physical protection, but anti-vibration gloves are thick and unwieldy and can actually increase 
risk because you have to grip tighter. But do use conventional gloves to keep your hands warm. But that doesn't prevent the anti-vibration glove propaganda, which again quotes a standard for the measurement of vibration in the palm of the hand, which doesn't really apply to most activities. And the standard introduction to standard actually says some gloves can increase the vibration transmitted to the hands. So they can make the situation worse, despite the fact they have demonstrated on their site different types of glove that don't work for different types of activity. Personal behavior, big one, maintain blood flow. Keep your hands warm, keep away from their exhaust and so on. Exercise hands and fingers regularly during work and stop or reduce smoking. Minimize grip strength, ergonomics is very important. Break up work, short periods better than longer use. Get your blood flowing in between. Maintain equipment and use the best tool for the job. Know what the symptoms are and report them. Don't be tempted to assume they are normal. This is important that people do report any symptoms. Ergonomics is a key factor. The tighter you grip, the less blood circulation you're gonna get into your fingers. You know, you've all been to an airport or been shopping where you're carrying a heavy bag with a narrow handle and after five or ten minutes you have white painful fingers and that's without vibration. So you add vibration to the mix and you can see why ergonomics is so important. Tool maintenance is also an issue. Make sure the tools are properly maintained, air pressures, condition of tool bits, cutting discs, spin spindle wear, and so on. The key thing is to have a policy that says all operators who use the kit and they know when it's knackered should report any piece of kit, still works, but the vibration has gone high, put it in for maintenance so it can be corrected. We use statistics to, as a guide. As I said earlier, angle grinders, maintenance is important. Rivet guns, maintenance isn't because it doesn't make any difference. So you can use that to refine your maintenance category, categories. There's a winner of uh, the worst acronym competition. These are the key things to reduce personal risk from behavior and so on. Maintenance, keep tools well, well maintained, exercise hands, always report hand on vibration symptoms, don't smoke, ergonomics, using the right tools, the right job, reporting faulty and effective tools, poorly maintained, ensure you keep your hands warm and take short breaks. Now, vibration control, often regarded as not possible, changing processes and mechanizing. This is becoming more common, scabbling, precast elements, surface retarders, so you're eliminating the need for it. Scabbling is a massively high risk. Cutting rebar, use bolt croppers. Pile breaking, use remote control act and, and actuator manipulators. There's lots that can be done, changing the operation, changing the way you work on things. Retrofit anti-vibration devices are on the market. The HSC did some research fairly recently saying that most of them are unreliable and can actually increase risk. We have personal experience of this. Anti-vibration handle we were asked to evaluate. It had no effect whatsoever, and yet was still marketed as being effective. The only exception to this were vibration-reducing chisel sleeves, which reduced the vibration by 20 to 50%. Deflashing operation. We managed to reduce it from 32 meters per second down to one meter per second by decoupling the mount from the backstand grinder. Another case for Dennis on their lawnmowers, um, we managed to design a, 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 a novel um, handle mount that reduced the vibration from five to six meters per second squared down to one to two meters per second squared without compromising mower control. And in this particular case, We've done uh, some examples of vibration control remotely. So in this particular case, we're looking at mold filling. You've probably lain awake at night wondering how do they put the concrete into the molds for fence posts and gate posts and things. That's how they do it. They sent us that video. We designed a retrofit vibration control system that reduced the vibration from 28 meters per second squared down to 11.5 meters per second squared. And they also improve, improved productivity. So sometimes there are things that can be done. Usually not, but sometimes there are. Manufacturer's vibration data is again a, an area of mistakes. There are a whole load of vibration test standards that manufacturers must supply information that's been recorded to these standards. These are the declared values for vibration. However, they are designed to give repetitive results because no manufacturer wants to be at a disadvantage compared to their 
competitors. So for example, from for a, an angle grinder, it's an out of balance test. So it's an aluminum disc with a hole drilled in it and they suspend it from a cable and get the biggest operators they can to hold onto it. And that is the declared value. That does not represent the vibration you're going to get from fettling and cuts, particularly cutting off. So the declared vibration value should not be used in risk assessment. They can be used as an initial perhaps guide, but you can't use it to risk assessment unless you can show it's representative. And a few example, extreme examples, an angle grinder, supplier said three, we measured five to 12. A damp chipper, manufacturer says less than 2.5, the same for a damp riveter, and we're measuring eight to 17 meters per second squared in the field. So buy higher smooth, again, manufacturer's data. So you're looking at having a policy. You need every year or two, you need to go out to the market and see if there's anything better you can use for your high risk tools. So you're looking at assessing operational factors as well, not just the vibration. There's no point getting a high, a low vibration tool that takes four times the time to uh, do the same job because that gives you a worse dose than a higher vibration tool that's faster. So what you do is you look at vibra tool vibration, you look at ergonomics, you look at productivity, and you combine that information to decide what's the best tool for the job and keep a record of it so that you can present that to um, the HSE should it be necessary. Using reliable published representative field data, not lab data. Here's an example of traffic light system used by the hire companies. This is an extract from a hire company brochure. Amber rock drill, five to 10 meters per second squared up to two hours use without further risk assessment. So you'd say, well, I can use that for two hours before there's a high risk. We measured it 12 to 24 meters per second. So five minutes to reach the action value and 20 minutes to reach the limit value. So if you use this data as an assessment of risk, you could be at very high risk of damaging people. <clears throat> Health surveillance program, I shall just touch on here. You need health surveillance. There are five tiers. I suggest looking at the HSC regulatory guidance and L140 for sample questionnaires that you can do. A lot of the initial stuff is, due to, is to do with um, baseline checking and it's very simple, done in-house. Uh, answering questionnaires to try and make sure people are educated as to the risks and what the risks mean and what the symptoms of hand-on vibration conditions are. Key thing though is how you use the results. So it's the employee fit, but with HABs. You have to decide what you're going to do. Exposure reduction options, working condition options. Employee unfit due to HABs. Can you give them alternative work without vibration exposure? And where HABs continues to develop, you need to review risk assessments and control measures and report new cases under it all. So to summarize all that, I know there's a lot of information there. This is the vibration elements of the vibration management program you need to put in place. And the key thing is best practice does vary from circumstance to circumstance. So you have to take your circumstances into uh, account. Mismeasurement is the big one where most, where a lot of companies spend far too much money on a continuous basis on continuous monitoring, which isn't necessary. So none of the alternative measurement techniques can meet ISO 5349, so they do not provide accurate risk assessment data. Looking at the HSC guidance, no wrist or glove mounted device is suitable for use. Continuous monitoring don't, unless you can prove the cost is justified in terms of benefits. Would it change your risk reduction actions? That's the key question you need to ask yourself. Would what I'm planning to do, would it change my risk reduction actions. Spend your resources on risk reduction, not repeated measurements. And so the major, mis major myths which I've been covering today, the measurement and risk assessment mentality, which is focused far too much on repeating measurements and repeating measurements. You just need some reasonably accurate statistics to rank the risk and then take actions based on that ranking. Education and, and 
training is very important because of the effect on behavioral change you need to you need to implement behavioral change and and also the the way things are done to reduce risk ppe doesn't exist tool maintenance is very important and vibration control of sources rarely but sometimes very possible and purchasing policy or higher policy is very important also because the manufacturers are continuously developing better kit. It's down to actions and you don't have to do all these things one by one. They should all be done in parallel to reduce the risks. Questions? Thank you very much for that, Peter. We've had a, a few questions online and then I've had quite a few questions sent to me offline as well. So if I start with the ones online, uh, we can go from there. So Paul asks in the um, Q&A, do you recommend meters which can measure trigger time, which then helps calculate exposure? Um, one of the ones we recommend quite regularly is... Uh, there are several around, but the heavy meter is an example of one. It straps onto a tool and it just measures how long the tool is run for. So you move it. Generally, generally speaking, what we suggest is measure, you can buy this kit or hire it. Um, you can you can measure the, the, you know, you buy a few of these or hire a few of these, put them out in the department for a week or two until you've got accurate statistics. So you don't rely on just one measurement. You just do it over a short period of time and then move them on to the next department. And once you've got sufficiently accurate tool, uh, tool finger on trigger time data, you can just combine that with the vibration and work out the risks and rank them. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, next one I have is from Mary. Um, it's quite a large question, so I'll, I'll break it down as much as I can. I'm not sure if you can see it yourself, Peter, and maybe there's stuff you can, but going from it is I've seen a lot of awful reports from so-called occupational health companies recently undertaking HABs monitoring. They take the measurement on tool with a cue they report the um, in the table and then talk about trigger times in the report's narrative. That's it. No calculation per tool and no daily estimates per daily exposure scenario. They just gave the link and report saying, see the HSE calculator and then say to yourself, we can't estimate your daily um, rates scenarios because the work varies too much day to day. I don't believe their point um, on varies too much because in a 10 minute conversation with the worker on site, they could have at least estimated a few typical scenarios. I find their approach lazy. I have challenged them on this and they have been very defensive in um, that we haven't done anything wrong. Sadly, well, sadly, there's all too common. I mean, we, we run the IOSH competency course on HABs and we see, we probably see more reports than anyone except the HSE. And you know, sometimes you see these reports and you just think this company spent a lot of money on this. I want to go outside the room and bang my head against a wall. You know, what they've said is, is, is entirely accurate. You can make good estimates based on finger or trigger time. You can, you can, as I say, you can measure that over a period of time and you get the, st the stats. What's the worst day? What's the best day? And you can rank the risk. It's not hard. It's not rocket science. Thanks, Happy. The next one is, is there any good organisations that gather accurate field data for tools? I've got four questions on that, actually. So that comes up quite nicely. Well, I'm biased because we've got a massive database of field measurements, which we've all done ourselves. So it's all been done accurately. We've got thousands of measurements. And I would say we probably do 80% of our risk assessments as virtual assessments, which can be done by email by return, as long as we get an accurate tool register. There are other organizations there, for instance, organizations, you know, for particular industries who do have some reasonable field data um, that you can use as an initial estimate. And then you work out the finger trigger times roughly. What you're trying to do, don't get hung up on trying to be totally accurate because all you're after really is just a grading. What's the ranking? I mean, if you look at a breaker, you just, if someone is worried about, is, is, this, is this tool a very high vibration? Use it yourself for 10 minutes continuously. Do my hands feel a bit weird? Then there's risk. You know, you don't have to be obsessed with measurement. I mean, measuring is hard. When measurements come up for us, everyone puts their hands down. No one wants to do it because you have to go and stand in a field, maybe in the cold, in the rain, doing vibration measurements. And it takes ages to do it properly, which is why people take shortcuts and don't do it accurately. Thank you, Peter. Next question I have is often haves is passed over, is, is often a passed over subject by commercial and operations teams. How can we change their minds? 
again, it's down to education and training being too worthy. You know, I think case studies about people can't wipe their bottoms and things makes the point that this is a serious risk, you know, and talk to some people who have got serious. When, we, when we're doing toolbox talks or, or, or courses, we get some people on, the, on them who have got hand on vibration symptoms. For example, one of the things we do on our, in our courses is um, you talk to the safety officer in advance and go, okay, who's a troublemaker that you sort of doesn't bother with health and safety and things. And we get them to volunteer and get them to stick their hands in a bucket of freezing cold water and just forget about it for five minutes. And they then say, oh, I'm gonna take my hands out. Their hands are aching and hurting. So well, that's mild hand or vibration symptoms. Now, how do you feel? Anyone can do that. Mm. You know, um, you know the way they geld sheets by putting elastic bands around their testicles. Okay, if you do that around your fingers, tight, and leave it for three or four minutes, that starts to really hurt. That is very similar to handle vibration symptoms. So everyone can try this at home. Take it seriously. Meet a few people who've got serious damage. Another question I've got here, Peter, is do you find items such as noise and dust get more attention than the haves? Why is this? One, there's PPE for noise and haves. So, you know, the hierarchy of control, let's, you know, there's there's an out, there's a get out. Um, also vibration, I think is, I mean, noise is regarded as a somewhat technical subject, but it's been going on for longer and, and meters are simpler to use because you don't have to attach the transducer, you just wave it around in the vicinity of, of the noise source. It's regarded as more difficult, I think, and more technical. And there's a big industry involved in keeping it that way. Because it, you make a lot of money out of doing measurements and selling equipment. Whereas, you know, it, it, most, most organizations, you know the high risk equipment and you can more or less rank them just by feeling them or, or asking the operators. That's, as soon as you've got that information, you should start risk reduction. After that, you can start doing a more accurate risk assessment by virtual assessment or by doing a few measurements. But the key is to start acting on the data, acting on the risk. Thanks, Peter. Next question I've got is, in your opinion, what is the worst industry for HABs? Shipbuilding used to be pretty bad, <laughs> um, but that doesn't happen very much. Construction, demolition, or two, anything, anything using breakers, anything using scabblers, anything. Those are probably the worst industries for, for hand on vibration. I mean, it's all fairly obvious, the sort of equipment used in construction and demolition, you know, all sorts of breakers and very high impact tools and scabblers, very high risk equipment. Also things like um, using chainsaws, although chainsaws have improved massively. 10 years ago, very, very high levels. Now, some of the chainsaws around are pretty good. Next one we've got, Peter, is uh, do you know of any cases where these measuring tools um, have been discounted in a court of law? Well, there is, it's difficult to get some of the information, but there was a massive fine for a company doing construction for hand arm vibration. They had continuous monitoring in place, but they hadn't acted on the results. So the court, the, the, the end result was, look, you've measured everything. Thank you very much for that. They've given us the evidence to find you because you haven't reduced the risk. You've just measured it. You spend all your time and resources measuring it. The, the principle was we spent a massive amount of money on halves, but you'd spent it on the wrong thing. So you don't get any brownie points from the court. The, the last one I've got here offline, um, Peter, is how do small companies afford putting together all of these lists um, uh, and assessments? Well, a small company will only have a few tools. So do a spreadsheet and put down, try and collect vibration from reputable sources. And this is, you know, you, you can go online and, and after a little while, you can get rough ideas of the vibration it's like to be uh, generated by the tools you're using on the activities you're using, make sure it's the right activities. You can also do a quick assessment, finger on trigger time yourself, and just put that into the HSC um, calculator and that will tell you what the risks are and you can rank them and then start doing some of the things simple things you know temperature gloves etc to reduce risk that's all the hsc will expect of you so 
we've got two more which just jumped in on the um, Q and A's um, here. One is, how can you manage seasonal emergency work where exposure could be higher over short periods? Again, while the exposure is higher, you need to evaluate the risk roughly and, and rank it. And so, you know, you've got seasonal workers, yeah, they may only be working for a short period, but very high risk, such as grounds maintenance, for example, you know, certain types of grounds maintenance. But you know what equipment they're using and you know how long they're using it for, so it's not a problem. So the next one we have is, what, in your opinion, of engine-driven vibratory equipment against battery-operated equipment? In general, electrical battery-operated stuff is lower vibration, in general. Um, a lot of developments in this field, um, which is good to see, and the equipment is getting better because the manufacturers have realized there's a commercial value in having low vibration equipment because there is no PPE. They haven't done the same with noise because they have a get out clause. They say safe use requires the use of hearing protection. Since that's not the case for vibration, they've been very incentivized to reduce vibration. And in general, electrical kit is lower vibration than combustion engine kit. Peter, the another one we got is we have an annual occupational health program for our joiners, plumbers, etc. And anyone who reports um, blanching or tingling in the hands are recalled for tier four HABS testing, even when it doesn't give a positive diagnosis. They are recommended for a tier four every six to twelve months afterwards, which is very costly and it has to be carried out by an occupational health specialist. Is this a waste of money? Is there something else we could do, such as just monitor at tier two? Um, I would be concerned if you have to do continual monitoring because you need to put a risk reduction program in place that stops it happening at, at source. So that does seem to be, if you like, spending too much money on after the effect. I mean, if you're doing the same person every year, that shouldn't happen, really. You know, what's the necessity for that? If someone has got symptoms, then you have to get them uh, evaluated as to how bad the symptoms are and then make a decision. Again, as I very briefly touched on, are they okay to use vibrating equipment with reduced exposure or must they be taken off vibration equipment, vibrating equipment? You shouldn't just carry on doing health surveillance on the same people or evaluating it. You should be reducing the risk and stopping people. The, the whole key thing is you do not want this to develop. If someone gets initial symptoms, you do want, not want them to get worse because there is no treatment for any of it. Any damage you get is permanent. If you're very young, you can get some improvement on, on um, the circulation issues, numbness and so on. But other than that, there is no treatment. You're trying to stop it developing. Thank you, Peter. We've got, we've got time for one more question. Um, this one's from Mary. Uh, I'll just sum her up um, just because of time. But uh, what is your view on the EAV trigger for health surveillance being sufficiently proactive to protect health? 2.5, as I said, is a guess. And the there is a risk. Generally, it's sort of accepted that the risk of some kind of effect or damage from handle vibration starts at around one meter per second squared. But the HSC decide on 2.5, you know, very low temperature and very bad ergonomics, you might get some slight damage at one meter per second squared. But it's very, very difficult. There are too many variables. You know, there's, there's blood circulation due to genetic effects and so on, just for someone's general health. There's temperature, there's ergonomics. There are so many variables. That's, that's the problem in defining exactly where risk starts. Thank you, Peter. Um, just closing it out now, Peter, just want to say on behalf of the IOSH Construction Group, thank you very much for your time today and your presentation. And I just want to thank all of those who've taken part in today's presentation. As always, we will have more presentations and webinars coming forward. Uh, and once again, thank you all very much for your time. Have a good week.